Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report now presents American Marketing System with Paul Schmutker, Indiana Director of the National Farmers Organization from Napanese, Indiana. Here now is Paul Schmutker presenting at Corning, Iowa, headquarters of the National Farmers Organization, American Marketing System. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'd like to talk to you about the farm problem. Almost everybody in America is aware of a farm problem. I don't think you could pull anybody off of the street at random that, and ask them about the farm problem, but what they would be aware of a farm problem. What the problem is may vary in people's minds. I have also an opinion of the farm problem, what it is, and what it takes, or what the solution to the farm problem is. Many people talk about the farm problem, but not too many people really feel that there is a, an easy, good, solid solution to the farm problem. And in doing this, I'd like to show you two comparisons, two distinct different market systems that are in operation in America. Most people feel that the farm problem is surplus. In other words, the American farmer has simply outproduced himself and caused his own problem through his own efficiency by producing more food than the American people can consume. In the process, due to his market system, he receives a lower and lower price for the products that he, re that he produces. Well, over the past 15 years, almost every farm release, whether it was in a daily newspaper, whether it was in a farm magazine, or whether it was in a radio release, the one word that I remember most is the word surplus. Surplus. We hear it over and over and over again. Once in a while, I feel maybe this word was pushed at the American farmer intentionally to get him to feel that he, that he is hopeless in his market system to help himself. I'd like to show you today how to eliminate farm surpluses. This is, I would like to do it on the blackboard. And in doing this, again, I will be comparing two distinct market systems in operation in America. First of all, I'd like to talk about the manufacturer's market system. The manufacturer, the man that buys screws, bolts, rubber, steel, and the things that he uses to build the product, and then starts to market with it. So if you can read my writing, I'll put down here at the bottom the word abbreviated manufacture. He builds that product, and after he has it built, he pays for freight, he pays for labor, and after he has all his costs added up, the product is built, he then needs to reach the consumer. And in the process of reaching that consumer, he starts to market through a market system composed of various people we have the dealer, we have the wholesaler, we have the distributor, we have a lot of other people in that market system. Each one of these people are operating with what is commonly known as a markup, a protected markup. And as he goes to market, each one of these people is quoted a price. And at the very top, we have what I call a consumer retail price. Again, abbreviated. Everything we buy in America today has a consumer retail price on it. It doesn't make any difference what it is, whether it's a piece of chalk, a blackboard, or a farm tractor, or a combine, or an automobile, and you can go on and on and on and on. Each one of these items does have a consumer retail price 
connected with it. This is how it's marketed. And in this market system, this manufacturer, the man that built the product, at that point, controls his market. He tells the people in his market system the various steps, what procedure, how it will be sold, what the price level is, what the level or how much floor space he uses, how much window display he uses on the way to market. He says, you can't mix my product with my competitor's product in certain instances. Consequently, he controls his market system. He tells the people in the market system how it will be sold. And he always ends up with a consumer retail price. This is normal. We expect this. Everybody expects this. Farmers expect this. They do business this way. And then I go on the other side of the board, and I will show you what kind of a market system the farmer uses. It's a little different. Again, food here at the top of the board. The product the, the American farmer produces has what I call a consumer retail price. The box of cornflakes, the bottle of milk, the pound of meat, anything that is labeled food, again, has a consumer retail price. And on the bottom here, we have the farmer. He creates a product. At least that's the way I like to look at it. He's the most important man in America as far as professions go. That again is an opinion. He puts fertilizer, seed, into the soil and he depends on nature to help create the most important product in America, bar none, no exceptions. Sure, the other people are important. Sure, we need refrigerators, we need automobiles, and we need farm tractors. We need a lot of things. But most of all, we need the farmer, the man that produces the food that everybody needs every day, no exception. So he creates this product, the most important, and he again has a market system, and he again starts to market with his product. And when he gets to the consumer retail price, he again has a dealer in his market system. We usually like to think of the dealer as being the chain store. Because the chain store handles most of the retail, retailing of the farmer's food. Most of it goes through the chain store. He is the farmer's dealer. We again go all the way up here. We again have the arrow here going to the consumer retail price of food. We again have the market system, same as on the other side. We again have the wholesaler. We again have the distributor. And we again have the dealer. We could put more people into that system, but this is enough to bring out the story. But here you see the arrows running the other way. We again have these people in here. The wholesaler possibly could be the man that the farmer sells his grain to, the first step, or where he unloads his livestock, the local buying station, the local sale barn, almost every place where he unloads it first, this is the wholesaler. Again, there's a markup connected with it, and again, there's a protection for the people within the market system, just like this one, the same kind of a markup, it may vary. Maybe the local elevator has six to 10 cents per bushel as a markup. The very same, same thing is over here, except you notice the arrows going the other way. Why? Because of the way the farmer sells. He doesn't sell like this man. He has no voice in his market system. He has nothing to say about grading or condition of sale. Therefore, somebody else, some place in this area here, the points that go into the market system originate. Backward from this one, the farmer at this point accepts the fact that these people are in his system. They should be there, the same as over here. He, they should be there. They should have a markup, or they won't be in business very long. So therefore, they're in there. 
it's accepted, why doesn't the farmer price his product? How does he sell? What are the terms that he uses? I'm well aware of what the terms are. And if you're acquainted with other farm producers, you also are aware of what they are. For example, how much are you paying? See the arrows going this way? How much are you paying? What's the price today? What will you give me? This type of thing. This is how the farmer goes to market. He doesn't really sell. He disposes of his product by saying, what will you give me? a beggar's market with the arrows running down instead of up with the most important product in America. Why is this necessary? Why does this come about? Let's talk about the answer to these questions. Why this, why that? Why does the farmer sell different than anybody else when he has the most important product in the world? No exception. In order to do that, again, it's only because this is the way it has always been. People are reluctant to change. This brings me to the number one goal of NFO, and that is for farmers, as well as manufacturers, to be able to set a price, to be able to have a voice in the market system of the product that he produced. To, so I will abbreviate here again in real short sentence the word charge and put this dollar sign here to promote charging a price for the product that he produces. Why can't he charge? You notice here at this point the consumer retail price is on at this point, it is not. The farmer again is told that he can't charge a price because he has too much. He is operating with this market system. He's operating with what is called the supply and demand market system. Why is it then that with the very same supply that the farmer produces, these people here are able to charge a price? with the very same demand that the farmer works with. Where is the difference? Why should there be a difference? These people will not sell like the farmer sells, although they sell all the farmer produce. These people cannot seemingly sell all that they produce. The farmer has always been able to sell every bushel, every quart, every pound that he produced. We have sold it all. We have disposed of all of it. It all went to market. Yes, surplus, they said so. But they priced it here. They priced it here. Very unusual. They told us we had too much. If we had too much, how could they resell it? I keep bringing this point back because this seems to be where the whole problem is hinging on. To be able to charge a price like these people do, and to have a voice in this market system here, to be able to do that, there are three things that need to be put into a system, into a market system, to permit this to be possible. To charge a price for food from the farm and be a businessman like the manufacturer. I'm actually proud to be a farmer because I do produce a very important product until the day I sell. I'm not so proud then, because then I have to say, what will you give me for my product, or my sweat, my toil, my labor, my investment? All that I have is in that commodity. It may even have taken as much as two years to produce before it goes to market. I have to say, well, what will you give me? And yet these same people use the same supply with the same demand, and they price it. This is the number one goal of National Farmers Organization, to maneuver the farmer into a position where he can charge a price like everybody else. To do this, first of all, we must organize.
organize, bringing farmers together, bringing production together into a pool whereby the buyers of farm commodities can get enough production without coming to the pool for a supply. Whenever that pool is big enough, at that point, the farmer will also be able to charge a price. These people charge, they also have what I call an oversupply. I use as an example shoes for no reason really, except it comes to my mind. I have never been in a shoe factory, but I can imagine I would see shoes all over that factory, lots of shoes. And when I get back to that factory, I would guess I would see a warehouse, probably half, maybe two thirds full of shoes. Lots of shoes. If they would quit building them in the factory today, maybe they could run for two or three months without replenishing that supply. Shoes all over the place. And then they start the market from the warehouse and I get in the shoe store and there is where I really see shoes. All over on both sides and down the middle is all I see, shoes, 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 shoes. Yet they are able to charge a, a price even though they have more than they can sell today. Again, the question comes, how is it done? Where is the difference? Is it possible that they have been able to charge a price because they are at this point organized? I recall lots of names of organizations, Manufacturers Association, Bankers Association, Medical Association, Veterinary Association, Dental Association, on and on and on. And now I find that everybody has organized. The farmer is told he has surplus. The farmer is told he should not organize because he may lose freedom. And yet, who is telling the farmer this? It normally is not farmers. It seems to be coming from people somewhere in this market system up through here, or maybe over here and back down. Some place in this area is where this is coming from. Do not organize, do not lose your freedom. And yet these people have all organized. I like to think of the attorney. And again, I don't know much about this profession, but I'm told that their rate runs something from 16 to 20 dollars per hour for their services because they are organized. Had they really lost freedom, I ask you. The same product that I produce, let's take a specialty crop, popcorn for an example. The popcorn that I may produce on my farm that possibly brings five cents a pound. After it is sent to market through these channels here, after it is processed, after it is popped and put in the sack and sold out at maybe 10 cents per bag, this turns out to be $2,000 per ton, the same product, the same supply that I was only able to get $100 per ton. Does it pay to organize? Did the popcorn processors lose freedom when they organized? It doesn't appear that way to me. So this is the thing that the farmer at this point must turn to. Organization, collective bargaining, charging a price. The only way he can do this is if he, first of all, puts into that organization, builds into it some mechanics to make this possible and feasible. Number one, he has to work with all commodities. We are in National Farmers Organization working with all commodities. We are starting with the major commodities, dairy, grain, and meat. Realizing that you cannot put a price tag on farm commodities on one commodity only. This is the formula or the solution to the farm problem that I'm giving you now. You have to include all commodities because if one commodity starts down and begins to show a loss on the farm, the farmers at that point begin to turn to another commodity, raising the supply, and at that point, wrecking the market. Jumping from one to the other, one farmer competing with another one. The peanut farmer in the south is competing with the soybean farmer in the Midwest. 
the cotton farmer, the tobacco farmer, the specialty crop farmer, they are all in competition. And in order to be able to charge a price, the goal of NFO, you have to include all commodities, bringing them up in relative balance so that you do not have one crop out of balance with the rest. At that point, you can raise your price level, be able to charge, have a voice in the condition of sale, and put the price tag on, write the contract, put it in there like these people over here. This is what you need to do, all commodities. Point number two that needs to be in this formula for success. Point number two is this. You have to go nationwide. We realize that in order to be successful in charging a price for food from the farm, you can't do it in one county, in one state, or in one area. We know that this milk can be shipped from Wisconsin, Minnesota, into Indiana, Ohio, or even as far away as the coast. We know this. But what happens? What has the dairy farmer been told over the past number of years? He's been told that you can't raise the price of milk in Michigan because of the cheap Wisconsin, Minnesota milk. But what happens when you organize, bring into one large pool, the Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and the rest of the dairy farmers in the nation. Bring them all together into one common cause to be able to charge a price. You have to go nationwide. I understand this. This is NFO. We are now in 41 of the nation's states, organized, prepared, ready. This is the formula for success. This is the solution to the farm problem. It's only a matter of whether farmers will at this point adopt this solution and make it work. It's a program that they can uh, get at their problem. Sure, it won't happen by pushing a button, pulling a chain, or waiting for somebody to do it, but it's a way for you, Mr. Farmer, to solve or at least get at your own problem. You can't solve it this way because you can't get at your problem. You have no voice in your market. But when you go nationwide with all commodities, this gives you an opportunity through an organization to meet your problem, the same as these people do. You see, I mentioned shoes a while back. They do have lots of shoes, but they don't have a surplus because they have a consumer retail price and it turns into an inventory. But the farmer has no inventory. He only has, under this system here, a surplus because he hasn't been able to put on the kitchen table everything he produced today. If he did, the wheat crop, the soybean crop, if he were able to sell it all tomorrow and get it on the kitchen table the day after harvest, what would you do the day following, the week following, and so on? So you have to have a program of nationwide and to turn the system around. And at that point, the farmer will enjoy an inventory the same as these people over here. This is an absolute must. Inventory, sure, the crop that is in my field now back home is going to be needed at a later date. It should be an inventory. The minute I price it, it will be an inventory. The Local elevator will have an inventory. The commercial storage, the commercial elevator, the large terminal warehouses will be full of inventory needed to come back in at a little later date, an inventory. And the US government, the consumer, everybody should be concerned about an inventory in the USA. And the USA, the government of the United States of America, will have to buy a supply at this point and label it reserve. This takes care of all the supply that we produce on the farm. There will be none left for surplus. It will turn into an inventory, and this is the solution. If we do end up with a little more supply under this program here, then we are able to sell the American people. We need mechanics to take care of it. This brings me to point number three.
surplus disposal, a way to meet your problem, the amount that you cannot sell to the American people, you need a way to handle it, like these people did. You've seen it on Main Street, clearance sales, surplus disposal, getting rid of the old merchandise, making room for the new. Under this system here, we can have a set of mechanics to move the amount that we can't move into the American market system, we can move it out into a world trade situation. If there is no market any place in the world to sell the amount that is left over after everybody has had enough to eat, then is when we can go into a giveaway program from run by our own farm organization, by farmers themselves, giving it to the people that are starving to death. We are willing to do this under this set of mechanics and make some friends where today there may be enemies any place in the world. This is the NFO program. This is the solution to the farm problem. Farmers getting together, meeting their problem, like the manufacturer has, taking a lesson. Sure, we're faced with imports. Sure, we're faced with imitations. But so is the manufacturer. He meets his problem. He's not concerned about imports. He may be concerned about them. But he doesn't lower his price because of imitations or because of imports. He doesn't lower his price. Under the old system, we can't meet our problem. Under the new system, we can meet it. As far as imitation goes, it comes back to this point here. They talk about imitation milk. Where do they get it? It still comes from the farm. And when you price all commodities, you solve that problem. If the American consumer would rather buy milk that is produced from soybeans and coconut oil or other items, this is OK, providing you price all commodities. This is, again, the formula, the solution to the farm problem. Once in a while, it may be necessary in order to, char to charge a price, in order to turn this arrow around to go into what we call a holding action. All this really is, is charging a price, emptying the pipelines between the farmer and the processor to bring him to the bargaining table and turn the arrows around. At this time, Mr. Farmer, I ask you, whose side are you on? Are you willing to help turn the arrows around as you become a member of National Farmers Organization and place your production into the pool that says, let's charge a price. As you do this, you become a part of the solution. If you don't, you seem to be a part of the problem because our problem is the way we sell. The solution is turning the arrows around and taking charge of our market and acting like a businessman, patterned after the manufacturer. U.S. Farm Report has featured American Marketing System with Paul Smutker, Indiana Director of the National Farmers Organization from Napanese, Indiana. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America which is a gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers.